Good morning. Da Jiao Zhao Shang Hao and Ron Xin Wei Ge Wei Jie Shao. So, as it's probably not very understandable, neither for English speakers and nor for Mandarin speakers, I was just trying to say good morning, everyone. It's an honor for me to present in front of you today. Some of you might know and remember that last year we've celebrated the 25th anniversary of Linux. Suzo is also turning 25 years old in 2017, which makes us one of the older, if not the oldest, company focused on open source and Linux. And while we cannot really have a toast right now, we hope to spend some time with you later today or during the remaining of the year. So besides eating cakes and peach dumplings in China, singing and drinking, what are people doing when celebra celebrating anniversaries? Well, sometimes they watch with nostalgia some old family pictures to remember the past and see how things have changed. This is a picture from one of the very first Linux conferences held in Germany, and there are probably familiar faces on that picture. So you might recognize the person in the middle, sitting on the left shoulder of Dirk Hundel, who were both speaking here this morning on stage 23 years later. On that picture from Suze, we also have Olaf Kirsch, our VP Linux Enterprise Research and Development, wearing a yellow shirt, and Ralph Flaxa, our president of engineering, wearing a purple shirt. And to comply with the Linux Foundation code of conduct, I cannot really comment on how the body of Ralph has changed over that time, but I can still make a little bit fun of how he was wearing uh, some shirts back then. So in the last two and a half decades, software, hardware, and networking have drastically evolved. With the development of the World Wide Web, of cloud, of virtualization, and a lot of technologies. IT has changed dramatically as well thanks to the mass adoption of open source in general and of Linux in particular across all industries and use cases. For example, in high performance computing, it has progressed a lot thanks to open source and also thanks to the innovation coming from China. At SUSE, we have witnessed and fueled firsthand such an adoption and even for highly critical applications and data. I would say especially for them and for enterprise use, actually, where the security, the stability, and the flexibility that open source can provide have helped them a lot. So now that open source has won, now that the open source doors are opened, widely open to large blue skies or to large blue oceans, as the gentleman from Huawei referred to yesterday during his keynotes, we should continue to keep working collectively on making sure that we limit what could be obstructing the door. Because in human history, there are endless examples of great concepts that have been misused and banned for complying with individual goals, ultimately corrupting, if not destroying, the concepts most of the time. Being involved with open source should not only be about consuming the available pieces of code, but about contributing to it. This is about sharing, both getting and giving, even if only a little. And it's not about simply contributing, but contributing in a healthy and constructive way to help the projects and their respective communities, rather than contributing for oneself. This should be about building, enabling and sustaining communities, empowering them, rather than having them controlled by single companies. Companies should collaborate as peers with other companies and individuals. We should be working together at collectively solving short- and long-term generic problems that the, problem, that the projects are addressing, rather than focusing on corporate-specific requirements when trying to build unique selling points or trying to differentiate from the competition. If this needs to be done, it should be done when creating products and solutions downstream, or when building and wrapping services around them, and not inside the project, driving and dragging them to one-sided directions. Because this leads to fragmentation of the efforts, this leads to a decreased interest of communities, as well as to some sort of vendor lock-in. 
So while nowadays a lot of contributions are coming from companies, and with that comes a focus on solving end user needs as well, which is certainly a good thing for projects, we should still aim at having communities come first, at transparently opening up to partners and individuals, and overall be responsible, corporate, open source contributors, no matter which company we work for. Only having the code available is not enough in itself to ensure long-term viability of open source. We need to keep working on fostering inclusive environments for everybody to contribute to. And last but not least, we need to keep having fun and solving technical challenges together for the next decades to come. If we also look at where we are today compared to 25 years ago, it's also very clear that the number of open source projects is very high, as Jim mentioned yesterday morning during his, his keynote too. And there is a lot of logo on that slide representing the current Linux Foundation projects. There's even more when considering other foundations, let alone the millions of projects on GitHub. And that's absolutely a good thing. By no means should one try to restrict or control that, assuming one will have the power to do so, which is luckily not the case. It's a good thing, but it's creating potentially some challenges for the adoption of open source in enterprise, because it can make it more complicated for a company to assess which projects to look at specifically for their needs, which projects to participate and contribute to, which ones to use in production. There are some interesting new work being done in the Linux Foundation, in the networking space, for instance. You might have heard about that yesterday during the, the keynote of Dave Ward's. The open networking umbrella idea is to try harmonizing all the efforts that are being done in networking together. It was also presented here in Beijing last week during the OPNAV summit, actually. So with more and more projects being around, and most of them growing faster than ever, one key aspect to consider is how to continuously interface them. And this is not only a, a theoretical engineering exercise, it's very common to see many different projects having to coexist in real-life IT architectures. They have to be able to be installed and configured together, to work and run together, to evolve together, even though they might have specifics and different release and life cycles. I just wanted to illustrate here one of the frequent scenarios that we see where Linux is involved, virtualization and container, software-defined networking and storage, as well as OpenStack and Cloud Foundry. There's also OPNAV in a different color on that slide because I wanted to take the opportunity to state again that OPNAV is not only about networking, but it's also about integrating and testing those kind of diverse scenarios involving multiple projects together and contributing back to the projects. So this means that today, as communities, as companies, as individuals, more than ever, we have to work and collaborate efficiently together, and that's not only in single projects, but across many different ones. And unlike 25 years ago, where a single developer could make a difference alone, we now have to embrace and facilitate the diversity and collaboration in our communities. It's as important as making sure that smart ideas are implemented. So at SUSE, what we've started with and continue to focus on Linux and core open source technologies, we've noticed early on that facilitating the coexistence of multiple projects was very important because enterprises have existing pieces of IT to be accommodated. They also have new needs that require the joint use of multiple projects together. This is why we, for instance, worked and contributed to the use of Ceph as a backend for OpenStack, to the expansion of the Cloud Foundry cloud provider interfaces, and to the integration of Kubernetes in OpenStack Magnum, for instance. This all has to run together. And even further than that, an open source based software defined infrastructure, as represented here, needs to work nicely when swapping any pieces of the stack with as many past, present, and future technologies and products as possible. This is about freedom of choice and accommodating the different software and hardware setups that are out there. 
Open source for enterprise IT is definitely not only about the infrastructure. It's also about enabling developers and applications that are both driving the enterprise business and also running on, or better, running with the infrastructure itself. Together with the evolution of how infrastructure is today abstracted, automated and consumed, there are changes in the tools, processes and culture of how software development is architectured, performed and continuously delivered into production. And that to a large extent, irrespective of the target infrastructure. So we are at LinuxCon, LC3, with collocated ContainerCon. Containers are obviously a great way to facilitate such a transformation. And while containers have been around for a while with Linux now, only having a container engine is not enough for enterprise use. Because aspects like ease of provisioning, ease of management, automation, security, container image scanning, signing and hosting, and others are needed. This is not enough for enterprise to rely on public, partially anonymous images for the level of trust they expect their business to run on. It's not enough for enterprise to expect timely patching for the level of security that they need. It's also not designed for simple, seamless, large-scale production use. So today, here in Beijing, we are extremely happy to announce a new SUSE product called SUSE Container as a Service Platform. And if you have listened to the keynote of the KCloud CEO yesterday, then we realized that we should have probably called that Cluster as a Service Platform. We might patch it for V2. We've been working on it, as usual, within communities and projects and with our partners, some of them being in the room. So this product comes with a container-optimized optimi host operating system, a container management and automation framework, as well as additional related tools, such as a role-based private registry, should it be needed. If not, because there are already existing pieces uh, in place in a given setup, it can also integrate with what's running. More specifically, through the Container as a Service platform comes with, uh, includes Kubernetes for automating and scaling the development, deployment, and operation of application containers across large and mixed clusters. It also includes a new OS called SUSE Micro OS, which is a purpose-built transactional upgrade lean operating system. And finally, it comes with a container engine and an integrated configuration of the cluster nodes, powered by the SALT project. So the bare metal version of that product has been in public beta since a couple of months already, so everyone can download it and set up a Kubernetes cluster with that. It should just take a couple of clicks to have it up and running completely from scratch. We received a ton of feedback and interest, which helped us to improve the beta version into a V1, which will be available in the next couple of weeks. Now, to conclude, and to illustrate the previous points of having multiple projects being needed and being stronger together. V1 already includes a few projects together, but we are working on a V2 and V3 for, um, to be released before the end of the year to also support public different public clouds, OpenStack, Cloud Foundry, and other open source projects. Because as we've discussed, those projects, technologies, have to work seamlessly together irrespective of where they are sitting and how they are used. Can she that cha? Chu da cha. Yo. How may they chan? Well, this was even worse than the introduction. So thank you for your attention and have a great conference. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you, Jim. Uh, hold on, Mary. Right um, so. We can download the Container as a Service platform today. Yeah. So you can just go onto the SUSE website. And it's for free. There's a website, and you can get it, set up your Kubernetes cluster like that. All right. So check it out. You go down to SUSE, download the Container as a Service platform, and check it out for yourselves. Thank you, everyone. We're going to uh, take a break, and uh, we've got sessions, so enjoy the day.